um, by 2020, transparency will have permeated the world of building products. We'll have good nutrition label-like data on what's in everything we use. Uh, we'll understand where it came from, what went into making it, uh, the, the emissions and pollution that came out in the process of making it. Um, and uh, we'll know everything we want to know about these products, right? But data, and it won't be just data. Data alone is not enough. What we'll have is good, actionable information. We'll have the support we need to interpret that data to make decisions about those products. Just like, just like nutrition labels on food wouldn't do us much good if we didn't have some science behind what are good fats and bad fats, healthy and unhealthy fats. We'll have similar information about, um, about the products and the material, to inform the material choices that we make. So, um, so that day is coming, but it's not here yet. Right now, we're kind of groping around in the dark. We know that many of the products we use are unnecessarily harmful to our health, to the other species we share the planet with, to the climate. We know these impacts are there, but we really only have glimpses and conjectures about exactly what those impacts are and what we should do about them. So um, a great example of this is the saga of flame retardants in furniture and furnishings. We've really been kept in the dark about the impacts of these materials in spite of efforts by some, including us in Environmental Building News, Alex has been talking about this for a long time. But until the Chicago Tribune's expose earlier this year, even we didn't realize just how deep the deceptive practices were uh, behind, behind this saga. Um, they really, the trade associations really managed to keep laws on the books that mandate the use of highly toxic and largely ineffective flame retardants in the cushioning materials in our furnishings. Um, it actually turns out, it's kind of interesting, that the tobacco lobby was behind a lot of this because they were trying to distract us from pushes to make them, to push them to create self-extinguishing cigarettes. So they chose instead to focus the attention on the furnishings in the home, the things that could burn. As a result, we have about two pounds of toxic flame retardants in every sofa, in the cushioning of every sofa in this country, which it turns out is not nearly enough to prevent that sofa from going up in flames once the upholstery fabric catches fire, but enough that we have detectable levels of these chemicals in people in every corner of the planet. Um, and now some of the worst offenders, some of the worst of these compounds are actually being eliminated, but we don't know for sure how much better the substitutes are because they're secret, they're proprietary, right? We can't tell exactly what's going on. So this leaves uh, designers and contractors trying to make smart choices, certainly in a tough predicament, but manufacturers also, look at this map here of the building industry, manufacturers also are, uh, are in a tough spot. Right, they're relying on their suppliers, sometimes having trouble getting information from them on exactly what's in the ingredients they're using. And even when they know what the ingredients are, may not always know uh, the health impacts or the environmental impacts of those ingredients. The science isn't always there. And, um, and then even if they know that, understanding what the concerns are of their customers is the next challenge. Right? You know, what, are they gonna, what are people going to care about? What do people want to watch out for? Um, so transparency is really an important solution to this. And it's not just about health. It's about environmental impacts more broadly in materials. And it's not even just about materials. We're seeing a real movement towards transparency happening across the building sector with, for example, energy reporting mandates in, uh, in commercial buildings. New York City is about to come out with data on uh, exactly how much energy almost every large building in the city uses. Um, big, big shift here, big trend. Focusing back on materials, though, um, in order to conceive of and work with transparency, we have to understand the framework with which we're working. And when it comes to building materials, the framework that we're talking about is planet Earth, right? Everything we use begins as the Earth, gets, goes through a series of transformations, refinements, installation, becomes part of a building, gets used, and then eventually returns to the Earth, right? This is a closed system. This is the planet that we're working in with, these, with this information. Um, if we do our job, we might uh, make that cycle a little shorter and be recycle and extend the life of some of those ingredients. We might even reuse some of them and extend the life further through an even shorter cycle of some of those materials. But we're all doing this within this closed system. Now, there's a, a practice of uh, quantifying inputs and outputs at each step of the way, and that's what we call environmental life cycle assessment. 
right? That's where you're, you're putting numbers, you're putting quantities to the resources that are going in every step along the way and the emissions and pollution coming out, creating a life cycle inventory. And then the next step in life cycle assessment is the impact assessment where you translate that inventory into actual uh, environmental impacts. So in LCA, we typically talk about a big six uh, impact categories, starting with global warming, climate change, um, ozone layer depletion, acidification, acid rain, uh, eutrophication, or the um, over uh, nutrient loading of surface waters. Uh, then we have ground level ozone as a, as a metric and depletion of non-renewable energy sources. These are the big six categories that are commonly talked about in LCA. And just covering these categories, an LCA report on a single product or service can typically run 100 pages or more. That's a lot of information, especially for a busy designer or contractor to deal with as they're trying to make choices. Right? That's a lot to ask them to handle. So fortunately, we also have, um, and this is initiated out of Europe, something called the Environmental Product Declaration, which is an essentially, a, essentially a summary of an LCA. So you have the LCA getting summarized in the Environmental Product Declaration, and the LCA itself is governed by, we heard this from Francesca earlier and, and um, Ed, product category rules for how to do an LCA for that particular category. And that's really important because that's what ensures that um, different products in that category are being studied, being analyzed in comparable ways following a certain set of rules. So um, another big advantage of these environmental product declarations, or EPDs as they've come to be called, is that they are third party validated. So you can trust the data behind them more because there's a whole process for providing independent validation of the EPD. These are just starting to come. Just a few leading companies have started producing EPDs for their products um, in this country. So we're really, we're getting there, right? We've got the framework for this transparency and this data that we need. We're well on our way. Well, not quite yet because there's some major impacts that this whole field of LCA and EPDs really has not properly addressed yet. They either completely ignore or they're really just giving lip service to things like um, health, human health, habitat disruption, some really, really key environmental impacts that are really important. So as we move into this world where we're starting to do LCAs on individual products and even on whole buildings, it's really important not to overstate what that LCA means or what that EPD conveys. It conveys really good information about those categories that LCA handles well. It doesn't say much, or if it does say a lot, you, you can't trust as much what it has to say about some of these other things. Well, in response to that situation, a group of architects and building owners have created a format for another kind of summary report they're calling a health product declaration. And so the health product declaration is a corollary to the environmental product declaration. And it's essentially providing a framework on how these users of the products want manufacturers to report ingredients and health hazards associated with those ingredients for, the, for their materials. So it's basically a for, it's just a format, right? It's just an empty, empty sheet that, or a table or data file that the manufacturers would fill out that provides, the, provides all the details on what's in their products. In a way, it's similar. It's an extension of or an evolution of material safety data sheets, right? Those exist on every job site. We're familiar with them. They provide information on acute health hazards with the use of a particular product. The health product declaration extends that into non-acute, chronic, long-term exposure concerns other concerns with these materials. The goal with health product declarations is 100% disclosure, that every little ingredient down to 100 parts per million will be reported on that, on that form. But it allows for, if certain things really are, have to be kept proprietary, it allows for keeping certain ingredients proprietary as long as you still disclose the health hazards, any potential health hazards associated with those ingredients. So, um, so we're getting there, right? With this health product declaration coming along, this is going to be released. Uh, version one is going to be released this fall at Greenbuild, and there's already a large number of companies, some represented here in the room. Um, a lot of others have been pilot testing it. A lot of uh, large architecture firms and some building owners have signed on as uh, endorsing it and committing to use it. Um, so we're getting there. It's getting us the data that we need. Um, but still, to a large extent, it's just data, and data alone I don't think we'll solve our problem. According to IDC, by 2010, we as a society had generated over a zettabyte, that's one with 15 zeros, of data 
right, in this world, and how much has that helped us? By 2020, that's gonna grow another 50-fold. So we've got, we're swimming in data, we've got more data than we need, the challenge is how do you turn that into actionable guidance, into information we can use to make smart decisions? And in that translation, there are some really important issues that happen, right? Because now you get into a conversation that involves values, it involves power dynamics, it involves politics. Who do you trust to help translate that data into actionable information? How should you understand what you're doing with that? So one example of where that's come up recently as an issue is uh, coal fly ash, right? For years, EPA, we at Building Green, others have really encouraged the use of coal fly ash as a substitute for cement in concrete because cement is very uh, carbon intensive, very greenhouse gas intensive. You can leave out some of that cement, use fly ash, you're making a lower impact concrete. But the environmental community, some of the especially health advocates, are now saying, wait a minute, there's a lot of toxic heavy metals in, in that fly ash. Or not a lot, but maybe trace amounts, but we don't know where that's gonna end up. It's, you're bringing it closer to where people are. Are you going to expose them to it? Um, we felt, we knew about this before, we felt, well, locking those up in the concrete is probably a good solution. Now EPA isn't so sure. They've backed off of their beneficial uses program, and everyone's waiting for a ruling on whether coal fly ash is gonna be classified as a hazardous waste, which will change the whole dynamic around the ability of people to, to reuse it. In fact, just this week, or was it last week, a couple of large producers of coal fly ash sued the EPA for the fact that they haven't made their ruling yet, because just the uncertainty, of course, is killing their business model. Um, so what's a designer to do in this situation? What's a supplier to do? There's very tough decisions to be made around even when the data exist. And in this case, I think not all the data is in on what the impacts are of these things. Uh, another example of that is bio-based alternatives to, to petrochemicals, right? We're seeing a lot of interest in bio-based uh, materials, bio-based substances to be used in, in, uh, as a substitute for petroleum-based materials. But are they really better? when you consider pesticides, fertilizers, heavy machinery that goes into growing the crops from which these bio-based things are produced, not necessarily. We need more data and we need good interpretation of the data to make these decisions. So at Building Green, we've always tried to do our best to provide that kind of uh, guidance in a form people can use. Our most recent effort was with a report we just put out on uh, avoiding um, hazardous chemicals in commercial building products, where we tried to reduce it down to something as simple as Spec this, not that, right? Keep it really, keep it really simple. Um, it was a big challenge in our office to, uh, to agree to simplify things this much because the, the answers are never really that simple. So there are some caveats in there. There's a lot more detail in the report about these choices, but we really wanted to make it as accessible as we could for people, busy people who have to make decisions in short amounts of, amounts of time. Um, other people have spoken about the impact of LEED and LEED has really been a driver in many ways um, in the industry, introducing new practices. Who, who, who heard of building commissioning outside of labs and mission critical facilities? No one did building, uh, building commissioning prior to LEED introducing it. And similarly, a lot of companies couldn't tell you if their product had any recycled content in it or how much that was until LEED came along and started incentivizing the use of recycled content. Um, in fact, Homoso, for over 100 years, has been made almost entirely recycled content material, but for most of that time, they tried to hide that fact. Right? Now it's become a selling point. I love this ad. It's hard to read this ransom note, right? Use Homosote on your next project or the tree gets it. <laughs> um, so with this next generation of lead rating systems uh, proposed uh, for release next year in 2013, lead is, um, lead is really pushing the industry in this direction of LCA and EPDs and more data and more transparency. And, um, and so let's take a look at exactly how that's happening. Um, so these are the new credits that are in lead version four and the proposed, uh, the draft that have been out for lead version four. There's a next draft coming out uh, in, a, in a few weeks. So there'll be some updates on this. But um, the first one is about whole building life cycle assessment. So using LCA practice to analyze at least the structure and shell of a whole building. The second one on material disclosure and optimization relies heavily on, on EPDs, environmental product declarations. But really wisely, um, LEED has chosen not to stop there, but to recognize the fact that LCA and EPDs don't address all the impacts we care about. So they've added the credit on responsible extraction of raw materials, which tries to get into the habitat issues, the habitat disruption. So this is the first time LEED has really gone beyond just forest products and extended into the impacts of mining the impacts of um, agricultural practices 
in terms of raw materials and where they come from. And then we have uh, material ingredient reporting that really fits in nicely with the health product declaration that I just spoke about, and then avoiding certain chemicals of concern. Um, well, of course, not everybody in the industry is really happy about this. This is a major change, and the idea that there might be chemicals targeted for, for elimination, or at least for, for discouraging the use of them in lead buildings, has really um, raised the ire of some. So there's a, there's a strong backlash, and there's uh, industry groups right now that are actively working to undermine lead, trying to get it banned from use in federal projects and various state, state projects around the country. Um, I think that's really a wrong-headed approach to how to deal with this issue. This is a trend that's coming, and I think they're really on the wrong side of history in, uh, in taking that kind of uh, no-holds-barred uh, fight against it. But I do have to say, it's not easy being a product manufacturer in a time of such change. How far do you decide to go in releasing your data to the public, releasing information, your secret sauce, about how your products are made in, requests, in response to these uh, demands for transparency? Traditionally, companies have chosen to hold their cards close, right? To put up the, hold up the proprietary uh, flag and say, um, you know, sorry, we can't tell you what's in our product, that's our secret. Well, that whole position is coming under fire now from two directions. First, you have um, customers who are saying, if you don't tell us what's in your product, we're not going to use it. Right? Google is exhibit A in this category. They're building a lot of space right now. And they've been really clear about the fact that they're not going to buy products for their, for their buildings that aren't, if they don't have good disclosure on what's in them and avoidance of certain key chemicals, chemicals of concern that Google has identified. The second uh, reason that's come under fire is as technology evolves, it's getting easy, easier to take your products to a lab and analyze what's in them and find out. So now we're in a situation where your competitors can, in fact, probably already have reverse engineered your product and know exactly what's in them. It's just your customers you're keeping in the dark. How much sense does that make? So um, architects and those customers, the architects and builders, are really, are really in a tough spot here, right? They want to do what they do best. Architects know how to design beautiful spaces, functional spaces. Now we're asking them to understand chemistry, to become toxicologists to deal with all this complex information. Um, and that's, that's really a tough sell for them. Some companies, some design firms have really stepped up and been part of the push for more of this information. Others are running in the other direction. There are architecture firms who are actively saying, we don't want it. Don't tell us what's in the products. They're worried about the liability of if some hazard, some health impact shows up in the building later, if it can be shown that they, know, they knew that something was going into it, that that's additional liability on them. That seems like a real head in the sand approach. Wouldn't it be better to know and take, make proactive decisions uh, now? But, um, but the architecture world is, is definitely mixed about this. Um, in the green building space, uh, the push for this kind of information has come, uh, again, I think initially from LEED, with uh, LEED for New Construction back when it first launched a, a dozen years ago, looking at things like um, uh, refrigerants, and certain VOCs and, and urea formaldehyde that it was encouraging people to avoid. And then the Green Guide, Green Guide for Healthcare came along and added a whole other list of ingredients, materials, substances that they encouraged people to avoid. Lead for Healthcare took some of those and then introduced a pilot program that covered the rest of them. But it wasn't until the Living Building Challenge uh, was introduced that we had something defined specifically as a red list, specific list of ingredients and the way the Living Building Challenge works Right? If you use any of those ingredients, you can't, your, your building doesn't comply. Right? It's all or nothing with Living Building Challenge. It's not points and, and, uh, and options like it is in LEED. So they have, now you have this red list that's identified a certain subsection of these ingredients. Um, EPA has its chemicals of concern list. Perkins and Will came out with their precautionary list. As you can see, we're generating quite a tangle of uh, related red lists here. Um, Healthy Building Network and Clean Production Action kind of tried to draw a bubble around the whole thing. And, um, and there you go. Now you've got this whole sort of complicated mess of stuff that we're now trying to deal with. Um, and the problem with red lists is not just that um, you know, they're hard to deal with as a manufacturer. How do you know what to avoid or not? But the whole mechanism is kind of tricky. In a way, what we've set up, I've got to credit uh, folks, the sustainability folks at Interface Floor for this. They recently published an essay where they laid this out. We've set up a game of, of Go Fish. Right? If you've got young kids at home, you know Go Fish. So you, the manufacturer, are there, the supplier, you're there holding your cards, and the architect or designer or contractor is coming to you and saying, so uh, does your product have any cadmium in it? And 
I'm going to look at your cards. Uh, nope, nope, go fish. Uh, what about arsenic? You got any arsenic in your product? Uh, no, nope, we're safe there, go fish. Um, it kind of is a funny dynamic, right? It's a funny relationship we've set up there. And if you compare that to the alternative, which is what if you were to use a health product declaration or something else and just lay all your cards out on the table, here it is, here's everything in our product, let's talk about that. Now you've set up a completely different relationship with your customers, with the people who are trying to use your product. They become your partners. They can work with you. If they identify things in your products that they don't like, they can come and ask you about them. You can talk about it. Maybe you agree with them, and you can work with them to find better substitutes. Maybe you don't agree. Maybe there's a reason you think that is the best ingredient to be using, and you can exp explain that and work with them to help them understand that situation. So as we're moving to a world in which how data is interpreted is at least as important as what the data is itself, having that kind of relationship and dialogue with your customers would seem to me to be paramount in terms of how you approach this kind of situation. So that's really the thought I want to leave you with, which is that as we, we really need to be working together collaboratively to solve the problems we all care about in this world. And transparency is at its most powerful if what it's going to do is lead to relationships based on trust so we can do that.